Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Dan Curhan, coming on for the third time. Um, Dan, you're awesome. Thanks for coming on again. You bet. Uh, welcome to the pod. So, um, I'm going to drink this Pilsner Urquell that's been in the office fridge for probably longer than it should be. Um, got this for a virtual trade show almost two years ago. <laughs> I think it'll still taste good. Let's see. Good vibe. Oh, and these are very nice uh, German dykes. Um, no, you mean German bottle openers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the Orbis bottle opener over here. It's Cheers. exactly what it was made for. Cheers. Oh, that's still delicious. I had friends over to my house one time, and... I gave them an option of what, like, style of beer based on what was in my fridge. And they picked a style of beer that had been in my fridge for a really long time. And they never said anything, but I'm pretty sure I gave them, like, terrible beer, and I feel horrible <laughs> about it. But it's, like, not something I go through regularly. Yeah, this may have seen better days, to be honest. Like, I might be drinking an expired beer, and just because I've been on that keto diet, I'm like, I, my palate for beer has just gone away. Oh, I'm sure it's delicious. Yeah, it's slightly hoppy. It's crisp. I mean, it, it tastes good to me. <laughs> not not worried about it. All that matters. But, yeah, I, we, we got this because... Um, there were these dudes from the Czech Republic at this virtual trade show who were hilarious. And, um, I mean, you're trying to engage people over the internet, which is a losing battle. <laughs> so, as we make a podcast, but like, it, it, I mean, you remember like late 2020 with like the virtual trade shows and you'd log on and there'd be like a dude with a webcam pointed up his nose, you know, that like, like you know, had changed people. his shirt since, you know, the bicentennial. And then, <laughs> You know, like, most people would have their camera off, you know, because they couldn't be bothered to shower. And then, like, um, it just, like, and maybe, like, you know, like, three people would show up for a webinar. Like, it was, it was, it was a dark time. It was a very dark time. I thrive on being in the office and, like, interacting with my fellow peoples. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, you do whatever you can to relate to your fellow humans. So, uh, all the Czech guys I noticed, because... I think I don't know. I can't, it's, it's like maybe like an eight-hour time zone shift from like where we are in Eastern Standard. I, I, it, some ridiculous time zone shift, and um, you know they were pulling you know like U.S. market hours, which you know like God bless them, and uh, they all were drinking Pilsner or Kell. <laughs> you know we had a happy hour. Like one guy had like three of them lined up. And that was what drew, like, you know, we, we gave all these talks and, like, talked about, like, insights of running, like, challenging projects under aggressive timelines. But the thing that got the most people to show up of all the virtual things was the happy hour, where you could bitch about how bad your day went from a sales perspective and, and drink. And, like, even in virtual form, like, that that had the best attendance of, of like, anything. Honestly, I mean, there were there were a couple thing. of webinars that did all right. Like, I mean, <laughs> well, but like, I, that, want to unload, right? Yeah, people for sure. That, like emotional connection, and a webinar is not an emotional connection. That's it. And so we tried to like, I, I think like, we tried to do like a virtual booth. So I mean, like this podcast studio started off as that virtual booth, and the idea was like, well, it'll be like a real trade show booth, and people can come in, and we'll have. You know, like a couple of SKA representatives there. We'll have swag on the table, and you know, we'll have like robots on display, and um, you know, then we can talk to people about you know their engineering problems and, and hook them. Yeah. And yeah. Um, nobody came. <laughs> like the people that like actually showed up to our Zoom were impressed. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's tough. Uh, five Reach of them. The hardest part. We were we were giving away prizes. We gave away quad rotors to people that like participated in in our events that we had, like like quad rotor with, with cameras on them. Yeah, <laughs> we still I didn't have that. It, it, it was crazy. Like in some cases, it was like a couple of hundred dollars per person to try to engage these people, 
like when you when it was all said and done like maybe even more like for some of the, yeah. the demos we put on and, and just because the attendance was so low so i don't know it's pretty pretty brutal i can imagine reach is definitely the hardest part of any endeavor if you don't have an audience like you don't have much yeah what I will say, though, is I do feel like I bonded with the Czech guys. So because it was going so slowly, um, our, our head of sales stuck around, and I ran to the beer store, and I got the same beer they were drinking. Nice. And, um, yeah, like, the one dude, like, invited me to come hang out with him in the Czech Republic last time I was in Europe. <laughs> like, That's so fun. That's such a fun gesture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So made friends. You got and lucky actually, that it was one you could find, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> When I, and, you know, once people get the hang of it, I actually did make a few other pandemic friends. So, like, sorry to go off on this tangent, but... How do you got I mean, this is all tangents on the show. But, like, uh, I... The Pittsburgh Robotics Network, um, I, I hosted a webinar uh, called Best Laid Plans, and it was basically, like, war stories of field robotics. And uh, I think it was the SVP of product at Gecko. Um, I can't remember one guy's title, but... There was a guy, I'm, I'm not going to say his name because I'm going to get his title wrong. Uh, it was Jurgen Pedersen of RE Squared. Um, and then I think that was the group. It was Gecko, RE Squared, and this other company I'm not going to mention. Who, I mean, I'm sure people can figure it out if they look it up. <laughs> and so um, that one had like decent attendance. And then what I did is I went on LinkedIn and I. Um, for some reason, they wouldn't give me contact information for the people, but they gave me everyone's name. I, I negotiated that. And so I just found every single person on LinkedIn and friended them and was like, thanks for coming to my webinar. And of those people, I ended up like hanging out with, I want to say like maybe eight of them. So, I mean, that wasn't bad. And like, like we still in touch, very good terms, you know, like, like yeah. you know, good professional That's acquaintanceships. Deep. That's the ideal outcome of like a networking event, right? Is yeah. like people you just are on great terms with and stay in touch with. And but to get like, eight contacts, I had to be the, the panel leader. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> bet. So even that right. was like, I mean, it, it was fun. I actually, I really liked that one. But, yeah. yeah. My fiance started her career in marketing and it kind of makes you appreciate what marketers do is like, you saw the attrition rate there. Yeah, for That's sure. You get them to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. That stuff's fun. Yeah. Totally. Uh, I and mean, you need to understand people a little bit to like... You might not need them now, but you know at some point in the future, like, this is a good connection to keep and hang on to. And like... Oh yeah. Two years down the road, reach out and you're just like, "Hey, I've got a perfect fit opportunity for you," and maybe it works out. No, I completely agree. Uh, actually, I want to. I can't remember what event it was, but there was another one where I got like all these contacts from like Fortune 500 companies um, that were. I think it was ASME's Inspection and Maintenance Robots Summit. It was like pretty fruitful as well. Like I gave a talk that people really really like. And that one I got pinged by like a whole bunch of, you know, heavy hitters. And then they gave me a contact list too. So that there were a few nice. kind of cool opportunities that spawned out of that. Um, and then with the PRN one, there was, there was an inspection maintenance, sorry, an inspection robot opportunity that came out of that one too. So, I mean, yeah, I guess they, they, they bore fruit. It just was like, it was a lot of, it was, you know, it's a funnel. I mean, but like, yeah. it was, it, it was like an interesting key part of it. The key yeah. part of it, right, is that you make these genuine, like, human connections. Oh, for people. sure. And, like, keep them alive. Because growing your network, A, takes a little bit of effort, but B, is, like, really rewarding when you can actually tap into it for something fruitful. But it's, like, starting with the end in mind too early is a death sentence <laughs> <laughs> no i completely agree right i mean you wouldn't pull your penis out on a first date <laughs> like, put it that way. unless 
she asked for it. Yeah, for but, sure. No. <laughs> but just like willy nilly. <laughs> yeah, right. That's gonna go over really well. You know, understanding people is super important. Yeah, for sure. Should we should we edit that out? <laughs> Carl, like, Carl, cut that out. <laughs> it it towed the line. I I hope we. Didn't I, I feel it. like that didn't cross a line, but I I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, we swear a little time on here. I feel conscious, like that's fine. So, right. The the line. I think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I I. I think it's a funny analogy that gets the point across. <laughs> like whatever. Anyway, so I'm reading a book called The Design of Everyday Things. My my long and drawn out like segue here uh, on understanding people. Um, it's it's a funny thing. Like psychology makes things you innately know explicit so they can feel simultaneously like you've learned nothing because like oh obviously i already knew that like when you're mean to someone they don't like you <laughs> like that's not a revelation but on the flip side if you kind of keep what you've learned in mind at the forefront it completely changes your worldview so kind of fun. Um, this is this is a design book, like product design. Interest. So there's truisms. Like I'm thinking of like how to win friends and influence people, where you're like, people like it when you smile. Like, duh. Right. <laughs> or uh, an instant snap smile is often less genuine than a smile that like grows in and fades, and like. <laughs> Exactly. As you, it's more like just, you know. That yeah. felt real, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so as you get to know people, you like understand the pace at which they smile versus not. And, you know, you associate that with. Sometimes I do the snap smile if I'm on the phone and I just want to come off warmer. Like I'll be like, you know, smile and dial. <laughs> You can hear you can hear a smiling strain on a voice, so that checks out. Yeah. Yeah. Right? But it's it's these little things that like you kinda know how to spot, but never really heard made explicit before. Alright, this beer is gross, I'm not gonna drink it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Good show, sir. Thanks, sir. Good show. <laughs> Yeah, so this this book is the the design of everyday things, and it's uh, it, it's really about how understanding humans and our psychology and behaviors can positively influence the design of things. Cheers. Cheers. Hopefully, this one's a little more palatable. Yeah, I love more Danny. I like this one. That one gets better with age. Beer gets better, <laughs> more fresh. <laughs> I didn't know this until like s embarrassingly recently, so you know. Well, actually, I I was under the impression that like whiskey stopped aging when it left the the barrel, but I have two bottles of Macallan Twelve on my bar at home, and um, mm. one of them's from like um, I have it from like a job I worked in 2013 and I just haven't finished it because it's got sentimental yep. value and the other one's from like a few years ago like my uncle gave it to me and they taste different like I don't know if it's that they were different batches or just the age but like one of them is just way mellower than the other one interesting which one is the mellower one I don't know the different they have different <laughs> labels like, yep. like the label styling changed during those years but I yep didn't label which is which i think i know because the corks disintegrated on one i'm guessing that's the older one but i don't know for sure i should have probably used the label maker you didn't know you were gonna do a head-to-head -head comparison it's fine i assumed it was the same stuff right <laughs> and that it wouldn't right. be any different i've never been in a position to do like a head-to-head -head comparison of the same thing over time that seems like a really interesting experiment yeah and so i have to wonder like did they change the rest like were different ingredients of 
Probably, right? Like, there's probably, like, different crops. Barrels? Different. Yeah, different barrels. Like, like, I mean, you know, like, different years of wine are, like, better or worse than other ones because of, like, how the weather was or, yeah. you know, whatever the hell's going on at that point in time. So it's got to be the same with, like, feed stock for whiskey, right? I mean, you'd think. Sure. We, we should ask a distiller. <laughs> this is interesting. This is not something I've ever dug into. I have no idea, but I'm a little curious. So I, I mean, now that we're off on booze, like, why not? Let's, let's, let's go with it. So there were these two brothers I knew in Milwaukee when I was working for Joy Mining. Well, I, I was friends with their sister, Jenna. Um, so I made friends with every Russian in Milwaukee and every Ukrainian, like everyone of Slavic descent, every, every Serbian, you know, like all, all these guys. Every left one, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was funny because actually I, w I went on a date with a Serbian person in Chicago and she knew all of the Russians and Ukrainians from Milwaukee. Oh so it, it definitely was a click. Like, you know, it was like, you know, okay. it was just like an international, like, you know, like cluster. I won't say it's not impressive. It's It's kind of impressive. Carry yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's fun. I mean, actually, like, if you want to have a good time, um, celebrate, like, VE Day with a bunch of Eastern Europeans. They won't call it VE Day. They'll call it Victory Day. <laughs> that just happened. That was very recent, right? Uh, victory in Europe after World War II. So this would have right. been, yeah. I'm pretty sure that was in the news fairly recently. Oh, I, I didn't even... Okay, wow. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. Oh, there's a bunch of, like... I, I'm such a World War II nerd. Like, when, when <laughs> do you remember what day? I should know this. I know, I know D-Day was June 6th. Putting me on the spot. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, a bunch of shit going on over there. 9th of May is oh, cool. Victory Day. Victory Day over Nazism. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, they were really about it. Like, you know, it's a lot of drinking. It was fun. Yep. yep. <laughs> Solid. One point, I mean, like, we're all, like, young professionals. Like, we're setting off fireworks. <laughs> Just acting like hooligans. It was, it was a good time. Yep. The tone has changed a little now that uh, Russia has, a war has kind of um, <laughs> done the thing that no one's supposed to do. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not the biggest fan of that. Oh, it's all good. But it's crazy that this day exists and is recognized by a good chunk of the world and yet there are still like adherents seething under the surface yeah but nobody <sighs> celebrates victory in japan day <laughs> yeah, right. it's, it's a different vibe right i mean we dropped an atomic bomb on the alley i don't want to get political but um. yeah this is uh Anyway, this is not a political podcast. Yeah. Um, back to the design of everyday things. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Psychology makes things you innately know explicit, which can feel profound and not. I'm like 40% of the way through this book, and it feels like everything that we've talked about so far has been kind of, I'm going to call it like at the tip of your tongue psychology. Kind of, sort of. What do you uh, mean? Like it's like about to say something, but then doesn't. It's stuff that you know. Like it's stuff that makes sense. There are seven stages to an interaction with a, a product or something that you've designed, and it's this like I'm not going to list them all, but it's this seven step process of you conceiving what you want to happen. You're thinking about how to do it. You're making it happen. You're doing the thing, and the thing that you interacted with is now sending the message kind of back to you over several steps, delivering feedback, and you're processing like what happened, assessing whether you got the action that you expected. So this is right? from like a market fit and customer interaction perspective? No, it's like a really slow motion. You just pressed a button, and it... Poof, sends the signal back to you that you press the button and then the light turns on and you're like oh that's what i wanted to happen oh so it's interacting with a with a user interface or a product 
Right, but okay. there's been like a hundred pages describing the psychology of like that kind of interaction. So was it just giving examples and like? There's some there's some examples. There's some references to meteor subjects coming later in the book. Uh, things that are designed. Like How many pages is this book? Signifiers, but very like. I want to get to the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I know I've done that. Right? I mean, yeah, no. I've, I feel like also like sometimes I'll, I'll read through an entire book and I'll be like, wait, they didn't. Like I, I got this book called the Lean Mastery Collection, and it was meant to be like Six Sigma. Uh, I'm, I might get this wrong. I, I think it was like. Six Sigma, we'll just say it was Six Sigma, like Kaizen, and like one other, like Agile, all rolled into one book. And it was like sure. a 12-hour audiobook. And I had like a road trip to somewhere that was 12 hours away, and I was like, I'm going to learn <laughs> all these fields in 12 hours. Yeah! How did, and, yeah. You know, did it, do it? It was... Uh, it was you maybe maybe maybe, maybe I didn't get my head around it, but it was it was very circular. Like it, it just felt like it was self referential and like just kind of talking about all the stuff you'd be able to do once you knew it, but then it never really explained how the thing worked or what it was. Yeah. And so I just ended up feeling like kind of cheated out of time I could have spent on another yeah. audiobook. <laughs> totally. They're not all super well done. I. So I'm midway through another book that, like, I've put off in favor of this one called uh, Product Development Flow. And the key premise that I've taken away so far is that, like, if you can evaluate every decision on the same metric, which is the economic impact to your business, then you are much better equipped at making decisions. The hard part is mapping everything to its economic impact interesting then, like what is the cost of a day of delay on this program the economic cost of like this part being late or of investing more time into saving some weight and projecting that down the road right is, you can that, see is that just on the operations side or does that also project to the sales side because i feel like well I, i'm sorry i should just let you answer the question that's a that's a good question. Um, it feels like what? Because I, I don't know. I don't think I've read that far. In. It's very dry. Fair. Point yeah. that I was trying to make. It's like it's ah, uh, that's brutal. It said the same thing like several times over, and it's like if you know this framework, you're going to be awesome. I'm going to tell you about the framework, and I'm like, please do so. <laughs> Forty pages in, and struggling through this one, and it still hasn't told me the framework. Yeah, so much to your point, like yeah. circular references and leading you on and never quite getting to the punchline, so to speak. Yeah, that's a book you want to put down for sure. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to power through and finish it because I believe there is wisdom within those pages. Would it be the power? worst thing in the world? Maybe, maybe this is like, I'm just kind of going off the cuff here, but... What if you were to just jump in, you know, like to like the three quarters mark, read a chapter, see if it's insightful. Like, I mean, obviously there's concepts that will have built on that you wouldn't have because you jumped in the middle, but just like be like, okay, this seems like pretty actionable. And then go back and read the whole thing if that test checks out. And then if it doesn't, just don't read the book. I gotta admit that's kind of an insightful strategy. I should probably try it. <laughs> Thanks. I just thought of it. I should have done it with that other book. <laughs> yeah, but like who thinks of doing that when they're reading a book? It's just like, mm, this is fun. Let me like skip halfway through and try again. Yeah, but if it isn't fun, right? I mean, that's that's where like maybe that, that comes into play. You know, it's like totally. you're drilling a core sample. Like, you know, it's like, should we build, you know, this thing here? Should I spend the time on this? You know, I don't know. I, I actually, <coughs> I handed someone a book the other day. Um, I just inhaled aggressively, sorry. It's, it's one that I haven't gotten to yet. I've been trying to read and admittedly I'm a little slower than I would like, but it's, I'm going to mispronounce the guy's name. I think it's like Shinji Oshingo. And 
um, I probably get his name horribly wrong, and I'm sorry if you're listening, but um, he like revolutionized like tool changing. Um, so the book's called the Smed System. So it's single minute exchange of dye, and he did this work for Toyota where he was able to get um, like I want to say like in some case like multi day or multi hour tool changes down to like minutes. Um, by like coming up with different clever ways to do it. So like in one example they showed illustrated, there's a bolt and he's like talking about how he like made a bet with the guy. If I can get it down to one single turn on that bolt, you know, like, and so what he did is he ended up cutting out like slices of the bolt all the way around in both that and the nut. And then you put it in where those slices are and then you turn it and it goes, it just engages but then you've still got all the thread engagement. So that was kind of a cool yep. one. And then, um, is that like pretty common practice? Or I thought, like I'd never seen it before. I've never seen that before. Yeah, either. right? Like no, that's fucking, no, that's fucking like, interesting. It's, it's clever. Yeah, yeah, it's a quarter turn fastener without like only having a quarter turn threads. You get full threads. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. It. Yeah. Yeah, and that was one where like, I handed another person this book and they just thumbed through it in, in like maybe like 20 minutes. And this is, it's not a big book, but it's also like, it's, there's a lot of, but you know, it's just like page, page, page. And then the guy shows me this and he's like, ah, check it out with <laughs> the quarter turn fastener. <laughs> and so he was definitely getting information out of it. Yeah. Like I, I always wonder, like I, I, I I too like will try to absorb every single detail and like there's got to be something to speed reading like that like I, I don't know like I, I guess I could see both sides of that there's another one that was cool where he talks about like how um, I think it's with injection molding presses although I might have this wrong um, there were like a bunch of parts they had to scrap because the machine was still heating up and uniformly uh, it wasn't always heated up correctly so it, it was just accepted that they have to throw some parts out um, and so um, he talked about like preheating the press to avoid that but then if you can preheat it I might get this wrong um, if you can preheat the tool um, before it even goes into the press so like if you've got the next tool sitting off to the side like in a heater and then mm -hmm. you exchange it in a heated state and then push, pop it in. You know, you get a bunch of extra parts because you don't have to wait for it to conform to the heat of the press. I thought that was kind of cool sure. too. Okay. That's a way to increase your cycle time on tool changes. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I think with a lot of like, um, like the Toyota production system, like the, it, there's an emphasis on like single piece flow. Yeah. And, and there's no way to achieve that economically without having a really, really fast tool exchange. So. Like, I don't yeah. know, it's, it's, it's an interesting, con actually, uh, our, our mutual friend Uriel was the one that recommended that book to me. Nice. So he, he's been doing some really cool stuff with, uh, manufacturing, just super duper high end, like bike packing and, uh, adventure sport buckles. So, oh, so, that, that, manufacturing oh, so you know, you know what he's up to. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful product. Like, it's, it's cool, beautiful. right? Yeah. They're super nice. He was like, did I give you any of those last time you visited me? I'm like. I wish. <laughs> Fucking awesome buckles. Yeah. The, no, it's it's a titanium rod and then a CNC machined aluminum chunk. Like, it, they're so nice. Um, I've been talking to that guy a lot. Like, like, I'm on the phone with him probably, like, three times a week these days. Like, that was a positive thing to come out of the pandemic is that, like, it doesn't matter where your friends are geographically, I feel like, these days. Like, you can, you can hang out, you know, like, from, like, anywhere. Technology has enabled a lot. Yeah. What? Well, like the... Oh, sorry. After you. Um, I was I was just gonna liken the the belt the the bag buckles to. Uh, there's this home light switch company called Buster and Punch. I, <laughs> I always remember like something Ariel said to me in when we were in college was like, I want to just I would like start a company where we design switches and knobs that are just like 
immensely satisfying. <laughs> and it's just like massive mechanical so, clunks that just feel so <laughs> unnecessarily high end. That's very him. And I, I'm pretty sure this is the company that has done that. <laughs> They're called Buster and Punch. It's like Buster and Punch. Yeah, I like that. It's, yeah. I, I, they're 75 bucks a light switch, so like I'm not about to change my whole condo over to them, but uh, <laughs> they are something to aspire to. Wait, right? so these are for the home market? I think so. They're like nice as fuck light switches. And <laughs> That's I awesome. just bought a condo, so I'm thinking about all the different shit that I can do. Wait, is and that like a condo? I thought it was a townhome for some reason. It's the second and loft third, which we're in. Oh, cool. Floor of a duplex. That's so awesome. I have a neighbor downstairs, and that's it. Sweet. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's still fresh, still kind of getting settled. We moved in on the 25th of April, so I've been in less than a month. Nice. Um, but the first fucking project is replacing the light switches in the kitchen <laughs> because the workflow is awful you have the door that you go into the kitchen to from the dining room right it's like a really high traffic doorway dining room into kitchen right in front of the stove and then the next thing in line is the sink and then you have this expansive countertop your light switch options are twofold you either walk in substantially far past the sink, past the fridge, <laughs> and take a left turn to the other side of the fridge to push the light switch. That's funny. Or you walk all the way into the kitchen to the very opposite end of the kitchen and push the light switch down there. Wait, there's a three-way switch and they did that? There's two one-way switches on two different light fixtures in the ceiling one <laughs> close to the fridge and one at the far end of the room but so that but way, that switch doesn't go to an adjacent fixture it's like all the way no <laughs> well it's, it's a switch to one fixture and that's it they're not three-way switches which you need to like have two switches control one item yeah so they don't control the same thing you go to the one by the fridge and you eliminate the light kind of by the sink and you go all the way in and you eliminate the light that's over the counters it's funny. <laughs> so I bought some light switches to like change today. Nice. Uh, so does that mean you're going to drop new up. new locations for light switches? No, they're they're dimmer switches now, and I have some heat bulbs left over from my apartment, so I'm going to change them out for like rocker switches that are not dimming, so that I can put the heat bulbs in the kitchen and just be like, it works. So turn on the kitchen. Oh, that's sweet. Have you seen those hue switches you can get? that mount on the no. wall those are pretty cool so you can get uh it's it's like a little thing that you can bolt to your wall or it has adhesive on it and then it's got two neodymium magnets and that holds like a little remote that's like that big and then there's on off and then dim um and then you can map it to like any hue bulbs that you want so cool. you I, I i have two of them next to my bed um one of them turns off the lights for my entire place so when I'm going to bed, I just don't have to remember if I like left lights on or not. That's dependent on all of your bulbs being hue? Correct. So I actually have some smart life uh, devices as well, and it does not turn those off. So my, yeah. my procedure, uh, this is kind of clunky, is I'll hit the off button on the hue. And that was great when I only had hue bulbs. It was just like, done. You know? And, but like... Well, a little more to my bed routine than that. I usually set on my alarms for the next day and everything, but like <laughs> on my schedule. But anyway, uh, from a lights perspective, that was it. Um, but now it's like I'll, I'll hit that switch and then I'll go on my phone into the Smart Life app and then I'll manually toggle off all the other stuff. I've been trying to find like a button that's compatible with like Smart Home, but it's just mm -hmm. I, I haven't gotten around to that yet because it would be great to just have one or two buttons that I can hit and just turn off everything oh, um, yeah i mean i know amazon made the like order this item button but what? like someone needs to do that for like a programmable subroutine of general purpose well, actually uh let's see if i can show you uh so the spotlights in the studio here are hooked up to uh automation it's yeah, very clunky 
it goes through uh, if this then that, but it's this product called the uh, Stream Deck. And so it's pretty oh. nifty because um, there's like little LCDs on each button. And so you can so, put a different icon on each. That's correct. Want. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and, and I think it's like a buck fifty, and you get like fifteen little buttons with with screens on them. So it's it's pretty cool. So I've got like um, you know spotlights on, spotlights off, start recording, stop recording, uh, turn off the monitors, um, open the door, close the door. Um, you know, like, I don't know, just, uh, it's probably overly automated. And then I've got, like, buttons for changing, like, what screen comes up in, like, you know, Google Hangouts or Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, or what camera, I'm sorry. That's super fun. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of a neat <laughs> little, little device. And then I think they make a bigger version with, like, more buttons on it, but at the time I didn't realize I was going to go this hog wild with it. <laughs> so... If you could have your ideal button count, how many buttons would it be? Uh, for this studio or for like my bedside or for what? If you were to buy, I guess they're very different use cases, right? If you were to buy another one of those for kind of the same purpose. Well, so I, I do have one vacant button on this one to be fair, but I feel like that's not enough vacant buttons. Cause like I, if, well, yeah, it's yeah, like, it's right like you were saying to me about automation projects, like design the electrical enclosure, like, I, I can't remember if it was like 50% larger than you need it or like 70% larger, but like, I, I, don't I think it was 70, but maybe 50, right? Yeah, right. but like make it way bigger than it should be. So like, I would love to have like half the buttons vacant. So like if some other project came up that required automation, I had a whole bank of like just working space that I, I wouldn't have to relegate stuff to. Yeah. So like I think if I, if I had it all to do over, I think I would have gone with the one with twice money. But this is where it gets interesting is because from like a price perspective, I can't remember like what it was more, but it wasn't like that much, like like the per button cost I think was like roughly the same. Like it was like, maybe it was like $250 for the one with like 32 and it was like 150 for, so I'm like, I could just buy a second one of these if I need more buttons and then put yeah. it by side by sides. I think that was maybe the logic. But then USB index seems janky, but they have screens on them, so who cares? I don't know. <laughs> Predicting the future is challenging. Yeah, for sure. And everybody sucks at it. I mean, think about like what Back to the Future said the year 2000 would look like. Or 2005, <laughs> right? Because they went, like, was, was it 2005, I think, in Back to the Future 2, where there's like holographic sharks jumping out of billboards and... Marty McFly's jumping out of the way like it's like the train coming toward the people in the early cinema and uh, there were flying cars and hoverboards did you ever see that movie? Yeah. I think I saw the first one once but like there was a there's like to power his car at one point he takes a banana peel and sticks it in this device called Mr. Fusion <laughs> it's installed on his car <laughs> Which I thought was a cute bit. Like that was that was pretty funny. Um, yeah, we should all power cars on banana peels. Yeah, today. like it didn't make sense from a science perspective, but it was hilarious. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, the secret to time travel, right? It's yeah. Banana peels. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, yeah. What my my point is, like, the prediction was totally like, like the year two thousand was nothing like that, right? Or two thousand five or whatever. I mean, it was totally totally. And and there was tech that movie had no idea would have existed that was beyond the wildest dreams of the creators that is there and then there was ridiculous out there tech they predicted that never happened you know so yeah it was just interesting and i mean look at the jetsons right so like cars that puff around and like i don't know i mean obviously like the sci-fi has also gotten it right so like you look at like um communicator from star trek being like maybe a recursor to like the precursor of the flip phone you know, which is kind of interesting, but chicken and egg scenario. Right. A lot of technology is inspired by science fiction. I right? concur. It's like this social construct science fiction thing that exploded in popularity predicted this one thing that doesn't exist yet. Let's try and actually make that. Let's go. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if we had the communicator from <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. I was, yeah, I was just talking to someone about this last night, actually. Predicting the future? 
Nah, I just, uh, well, the idea that, like, sci-fi probably inspires, like, more than predicts, like, a, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's always really nice to engage with sci-fi that, like, does a good job world building. Yeah, well, but it was interesting because he was saying that, you know, like, Star Trek predicted, like, the cell phone, and I was like, well, what about fuel radios from World War II? That was before Star Trek. You know, and so... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but he's yeah. like, yeah, but the aesthetic of, of the communicator versus... I'm like, all right, yeah, you got me there. <laughs> sure, sure. But, like, the enabling tech came before that, so I don't know. About that. Communications is, like, a steady stream. You can follow that one from Alexander Graham Bell all the way into, like, FM Radio is in World War II. Well, even before phone. Alexander Graham Bell, I mean, there was the telegraph, right? And then even before that, there was mail... Right. Like people have been trying to talk Benjamin to people that are far away yeah. for a long ass time. Yeah. So, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But I mean, before mail, like, I, I don't know, like maybe like just carving something into a rock and hoping someone finds it. <laughs> yeah. But like, I would credit sci fi with predicting some inspiring. Things. Yeah, totally. But no matter what, like, predicting the future is really and no one's really good at it yeah and I feel like and, more often that's wrong than right like when you look oh, at always. it yeah. and so to circle back to something like well I mean, it would ago, be a good story right if it well sorry I, the I people to... the people that end up getting it right get like elevated and lauded for getting it right and then they try and do it again and they can't because they got <laughs> really lucky with something right they're not actually seeing the future. They just had an idea that somehow was really coincidental. Uh, two points. So one is, like, how many times do you think Nostradamus predicted the end of the world and it didn't happen? And the other one is... Um, I feel like one interesting variant to that where, like, it might have actually been, like, pretty clever on the part of the person doing it was uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. So... <laughs> Even though, I mean, like, the timing is way off and, like, we don't, we didn't have that level of space travel yet. Um, I thought it was interesting that when he showed these people flying, and it's beautiful eye candy, right? I mean, like, just the, mm -hmm. you can see that guy in a background as a, as a photographer. I mean, just with, just the amazing shots and set work and, yeah, I mean, it's just, just incredibly pretty. Um, but, um, the, uh when they're flying to space, they don't show NASA, they show Pan Am, you know, so I, I think it was important to him to show that, you know, these, this is private industry that's, that's yeah, enabling space us. Space is going to be privatized. And these, yeah, these weren't scientists, you know, and, and, you know, like, going up and, and, you know, like military, I mean, these were bureaucrats, you know, like, just, like, you know, like, on a business trip to space, and so... I thought that was an interesting kind of, like, you know, considered, I guess is the word I would use. Sure, sure. It, it imagined a world beyond the, uh, like, exciting frontier that space currently is. And, like, what's the next step beyond that when it loses its research use only <laughs> tag? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, so I was I was sort of aiming at uh, just a quick commentary on like predicting the future and having enough of things. And like we are currently trying really hard to predict demand and order enough spares of stuff. Across the board. Right? So like it's tough to know how many of the thing you're gonna need when the scope keeps changing <laughs> regularly <laughs> what have been some of your approaches to that because I, I i could talk about mine but i want to hear yours sure we're I'm, I'm, I'm currently advocating for like keeping a stock level of 50 percent above and beyond the initial batch of critical components smart that's that's kind of the threshold that that we're aiming at but like getting that instilled in in is this for production quantities or is this for like, just research quantities? this is prototypes okay but 
the thing with my, my, my factors of safety tend to be higher than that even sure sure i mean they may i'll double up on a lot of stuff they might want to be for sure um yeah we are using our prototypes as like development instruments so it's uh it's important to maintain them and support them and have the ecosystem necessary to keep them afloat yeah I which agree. You know, when you think about it it's like really good i don't want to call them training wheels but i will uh, really good training wheels for like when you launch a product into general market, you need these mechanisms in place to like support and maintain and kind of provide an inventory level of components. And, right? Yeah, it makes sense to me. It maps. How do, how do you account for like if you don't know what component you're going to need yet? Like, I'll tell you what I do a lot of times is I'll just order everything I think I might need. And that can get really, really expensive <laughs> really fast, obviously. Right. Um, but right. So, just with this current... Okay, sorry, I'll, I'll cut you off. I, I, I'll stop yeah. cutting you off. Carry on. <laughs> I was just going to say with this currently how hard it is to get stuff or how volatile the supply chain is. I mean, you see time and time again, just entire products have to be either redesigned or scrapped or, um, you know, I mean, yeah. whatever, because, you know didn't anticipate you might need this one particular thing or you didn't order enough and now you can't get them anymore or, or my chain is tangled yeah right now it's tough so it, um, oh sorry after after you <laughs> i'm a little sleep deprived <laughs> I feel like i'm being rude i'm sorry <laughs> oh my goodness it's like <laughs> you so um I don't even know where I was. I'm just like making fun of our, our friendship. Just talking about like, dude, I love you, man. <laughs> like, ten years and and you start filming us and like suddenly. <laughs> Go on. After you, good sir. Carry on. Oh fuck me! I guess you're right. <laughs> it's I, a little bit no, of a fraud. I can I can start fresh though. Uh, what? Do you have a better, a better like place marker for us? No, I take it. I don't care. Um, I mean, I, I so just for the people listening, like after our last episode, Dan was like, "We really should brainstorm this more." We were way too tangential over the map, and uh, we had kind of like a preparatory call today. And I feel like we're still all over the map, but I think it's an interesting conversation, and and we're talking about interesting things. Hopefully, there's some find content. Us. Yeah, hopefully people find this engaging. I, I kind of decided, like, I don't really care if people like it or not. <laughs> it's, it's bad, but hear me out. Like, I, I just, I have fun hanging out and talking to my friends. And I like putting out these podcasts because I feel like it kind of, like, gives people into an eye of how people that do what we do think. And so for the very few people that get all the way through these episodes. I love you. And also, um, <laughs> like, I mean, it's definitely going to be a niche audience and, and has been like a lot of it's like, like other engineers and, and like executives and researchers that are just very like minded. <laughs> if I'm being honest. And so that's, that's the people. Like a few people have come up to me and be like, "I love your podcast," I, and I'm like, like "I'm like, what? really? That's awesome!" Yeah. <laughs> and somebody's listening to it. <laughs> so, like I, I was at like the um, Masters of Robotic Systems Development, which is the masters I got uh, student demos this year. I went in, and uh, I, I caught like two demos. Uh, one of them was like an official demo, and the other one was like a grad student. I've kind of been giving a little bit of mentorship to. Um, who was like really excited that I came and invited me to his lab and him and his team did like a redux of the whole demo for me. So it was really nice of them. <laughs> and it was, it was really cool too. It was, it was a, um, I think it was a universal robot, um, but they had it programmed like really, really kind of nifty. And it was, um, it was like grabbing ingredients off a shelf um, and the positioning could be fucked up. So you could have it like yawed out by like, you know, 20 degrees, I think. There was a point at which, like, the camera couldn't read the QR code on the side thing anymore. But like, it was pretty good at compensating and, like, getting in and, like, grabbing it. 
and then it would pour the ingredients. So it was it was meant to be a culinary application. So like grabbing the, the stuff to make a thing, it would pour them into, um, I mean, this was, so they've changed the program a little bit. Now they have like a, one demo and then they work on the thing a bunch more and they've got a bunch more stuff. So this was like, you know, like version one. And so it would pour the ingredients onto a scale, which was hooked up to the computer that was running the thing. And it was like pretty accurate. And then it had like different, it was rules based. So it had like different um, subroutines, we'll call them, for pouring out. I know that's an outdated term, but fuck you. I'm going to say it anyway. They had different <laughs> subroutines for pouring out the different things. So one of them was like vinegar and it would just pour and there was a spout on the thing and, and it mm. could, it could, I think it was like within like a couple of grams and then another one was like chopped cucumbers and it would like, you know, like shake them, you know, and then they had like peanuts and it would shake, but at a different frequency. And so it was, it was pretty nifty. Like I, I thought it was like it was pretty, chopped pretty well put together. Chopped peanuts or chopped cucumbers are a fluid. Right? They're like kind of expand their container, not expand, but like take up the shape of their container, and you can pour them. But By that definition, for sure. Right. Fluid handling is tricky. Like really, it is. There's a lot of nuance to every different kind of fluid with its different viscosities and different like profiles of surface angles and surface tension and contact angles and like the ways that it interacts with stuff <laughs> there's a there's a course that's taught in civil engineering called soil mechanics oh i fucking love soil mechanics I, this is me, me being a nerd but yes uh, it's so great aka it's, terra mechanics right kind of it is a pile of angle of repose things. angle of repose <laughs> Yes, that's where I'm going. Like a pile of cucumber slices. There is like study that's been done to figure out what the like angle of repose of a pile of cucumber slices I would be. I fucking love Terra Mechanics. That's like one of my, f I am such a nerd for, for that kind of stuff. And like figuring out like how a mobile robot is going to cut through sand versus dirt versus like a paved road. I mean, versus that, regolith. Versus lunar regolith. Oh yeah, regolith. I didn't know that was a word. <laughs> so, I hope is, I'm getting that right. Is that just dirt on the moon? <laughs> moon soil. Yeah. It's regolith. That's cool. I, I did not know that. Well, I'm gonna check this out. Yeah, fair enough. I usually try not to Google stuff on here, but go for it. I don't even care anymore. Ooh, a, lay a region of loose, unconsolidated rock and dust that sits atop a layer of bedrock. So it's not necessarily on the moon, so that could be no, on Earth, on too. Earth, on Earth, regolith also includes soil. Oh, okay. So regolith, soil is a subset of regolith. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Today so we learned a thing! What would be... So does non-soil regolith only exist outside the earth and like laboratories or does sand also count as regolith and, and is not soil I would argue the latter sand counts as regolith it's okay. a loose layer of like stuff that forms piles well I, so then if you go into synthetics like if I put a ball pit on a concrete floor does the concrete floor count as bedrock and does the ball count as regular? <laughs> <laughs> or does that not count because it's it's synthetic and, and not McDonald's wouldn't have done very well calling it regolith pits. <laughs> you would not want your kid to be in a regolith pit. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, we learned the thing. I no, this is awesome. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I keep a journal of like my day my day to day, week to week, like my my task list. And every week I draw it's a bullet journal, which is like a, a dot journal. It it's got blank pages with a grid of dots and you draw the lines that you want to make the boxes that you want to fill in the structure that you it's totally customizable. Oh you've showed so, me this. I like this one. Yeah. So I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Um Every week on my spread, 
is a box for things that I have learned. And like honestly lately it hasn't been super full. It was super, super full when I started my my job in, in a new industry here. But things we learned. I'm gonna write regolith down in that. That's nice. a that's a good one. I, I, keep, I keep a journal of mistakes and lessons learned, but it's it's a digital document. Yeah. It's uh, I, I I just um I, I think I've told you about this before and I've already talked about the pie, I don't wanna repeat myself too much, but I started carrying like an actual real life notebook, even though I try to type my notes. Yeah. I, lo I love these Elon notebooks. I um if I ever get more viewers, like please sponsor me, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with an A, not not Elon, the other Elon. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it's um, it's kind of cool. I, I don't really, I kind of just ignore the grid pattern, which is maybe just me being a jerk. But it's like graph paper on one side, then it's like um, like this weird. You can't see it, but I'll, I'll show you later. Uh, it's I guess maybe like okay, so there are these cells that are like um, three times as wide as they are tall. On, on the other side, so I haven't really figured out a good way to use that yet. But I mean, I, I basically just scroll notes into it, and um, I like it because it fits in my back pocket. So if yes. I'm in the field, I, I can where like a laptop is impractical. I can I can have one of these on me. So if I'm like, you know, out on a shop floor and there's a million things going on and I don't want to miss an important detail, um, yeah. like I I always have this thing in my pocket because. I am yeah, otherwise you get lost my very quickly. Journal. Yeah. <laughs> right? You just, like, you need it next to you at all times. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and then what, what I try to do if I have a laptop or, like, a desktop available is just type my notes because then they're searchable. But it's good to have both. I mean, like, sometimes you want to draw a thing. Uh, sometimes you need to take it with you. Sometimes a laptop's impractical. I am starting to come to appreciate the searchability of digital note taking oh it's amazing that seems worthwhile but i mean i showed you that like cookbook concept i came up with in grad school where i was still able to track it down in google docs you were able to find it it was digital it was searchable like the the power of it is immense but for me there's like i i do not remember what i type most of the time like, it just doesn't have the same visceral connection for me that writing something down does. So I'm forever adherent to paper mediums to take my notes. And I don't go back and digitize. I rewrite them week after week if I need yeah, to, but, but I don't digitize them. I would argue, and, and this is something that somebody else argued to me at one point, and it took probably like three or four lessons for years for the lesson to sink in. And, not trying to tell you to live your life, but double entry is expensive. And so that time to transcribe your notes, uh, you will never get back. <laughs> so I don't know. It's, it's only, I mean, it's, it's becoming longer and longer, but uh, it, it took me a long time to just type my notes from the onset. And whenever I have the luxury, I swear by it now, because it's just so awesome to be able to search that stuff and, and share it with other people. And, I mean, if you're in a meeting and, and you send the notes to everyone else, like, I mean, you're a hero. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, really yeah. Appreciate and I appreciate that. I take time to do that, but it's, it's very much time. There is a solution here. Go on. My dad swears by it. I have yet to partake, and I'm, like, hesitant because I love the physicality of a real notebook. But remarkable. It's a paper-like tablet. It's like an e-ink tablet where you can take notes with a pen that feels like paper. Interesting. But it's digital, and you can convert your handwriting into text. You can, like, Wait, make really? PDFs. Yes. Because I, I know that, like, I mean, I'm really dating myself here, but I remember when the Palm Pilot tried to do that, and it was just a joke. Like, you had to write, like, a character in this area and, like, learn their scribble. Form. Yeah, exactly. There was a Palm Pilot, like, typeface that you had to, con I remember. Yeah, they had, like, some name for it because they couldn't be bothered. They could just say, hey, this technology is very young, we're sorry. 
<laughs> so. Yes, it's come a long way, right? Yeah, but like now you can write up a whole page and it'll just transcribe everything and like it's pretty accurate. Then you can like sketch a doodle and resize it and move it around so like you lay out your page differently if you need to. What's, what's the product called? I might just buy one. <laughs> it's called Remarkable. Remarkable. So, I, so you broke up for a minute there where we, we had like a link no failure. Ones. So I apologize, but... It happens. You froze earlier too. Remarkable. Remarkable. We, uh, that, that sounds remarkable. Do they make a version that can fit in your back pocket? Not that I know of. It's like, it's, it's kind of notebook sized. But I'm, I'm more intrigued than I want to admit just because of my like advocacy for the journal as a physical medium, you know? I mean, that seems like the best of both worlds if it works, right? I mean, I think it kind of does, right? Yeah. Except the back pocket like, oh. thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Other than that. Yeah, I mean, I, you be... know they're going to make a smaller version if that's if that's as good as you yeah. say it is. Can... They call it the world's thinnest tablet, the next generation paper tablet. Um... I don't want to be on my phone in this, but I really want to take this down in a note because oh, I know I'll forget if not. There's two versions. They don't have a tiny one yet. But I'm sure, I'm sure they're working on one. Like they, they have to be. You're not, you're not the only person that wants a notebook in their pocket. All right, I have a note to order one tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know how it goes. I'm a, a little jealous. That's a. I, mean, I haven't done it yet, right? Yeah, it's a thousand dollars. I might hold off. No, Three hundred. Ah, that ain't bad. useful somebody okay. had a product like that recently at a conference i was at and it might have even been the same one and i took down a paper note of what the product was <laughs> and you can see where this goes right i, I mean numbered notebooks i can't remember what one i put it in <laughs> so, yep. yeah so I mean, so this learning box that i have every new notebook i start it by writing out every learning note from every prior notebook again oh cool takes me a long time but i have it all there as like the preamble to the notebook and i refresh my memory on everything and i make sure that like it's it's in there that's awesome which is laborious but kind of effective interesting yeah no i mean it sounds like a time sink like you said but it does sound like a good way to refresh. I mean, I guess I'll reread books that are useful to me. Yeah. Like I've probably been through like how to win friends, and influence people like more times than I care to admit. Actually, yeah. there was, there was like a, a new guy in a work environment the other day, um, who was like making like a very obvious effort to like memorize everyone's name. And I'm like, Oh, Dale Carnegie. <laughs> I'm like, it's obvious you've read Dale Carnegie. And he kind of chuckled and we, sort of exchanged reading lists so that was kind of funny yeah. yeah i mean understanding people is huge yeah, having empathy sure. is huge like, don't be a dick of, <laughs> that's just the core right of it, i think part of the entire conflict of like my last career step was a combination of a a kind of lack of empathy and my response to it being again not particularly empathetic so i definitely didn't respond in a way that helped the situation uh and ended up really frustrated and kind of not happy um, i've always considered you to be a pretty empathic person though so that's that's interesting to me because i've known you a long time and i feel like not understanding people has not been a problem that I've ever really ID'd in you. But I mean, I've known you like as a friend. Yeah, I've sure. also known you in a professional context, though. Like, we work <laughs> together. These, these are all true statements. Yeah. But maybe the distinction is that I was able to articulate it after I started studying and caring about psychology. Interesting. So I approached the job that I'm in now with a completely different perspective. Okay, so like, 
you always had an intuition for it, but now you've made a direct effort to look at it head on. Right. And okay, right. that makes more sense. You do some reflecting, you figure out what did well, what didn't go well. You, you know, in my case, I dug into some like teachings of people. Um, but really, like, there is no growth without discomfort. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, coming out the other side, like, having prioritized understanding people from the perspective both of you know my world around me but also of understanding myself has changed everything yeah so, that's awesome oh i'm super stoked about it um but you know that's kind of a really long really roundabout tie back to this this design book that i was reading right <laughs> I mean, you could get there. It's like psychology makes a huge difference and I will forever and henceforth advocate for it. It's nice. like a, you know, thing that's worthwhile. I, I like this version of you. <laughs> it's kind of new to be honest. Yeah. Like this is, this is measured and thoughtful and well, like, and I feel like you, you got all that stuff instinctually. Like, I feel like you, you always were like a good friend and, fun to be around and I don't know if that stuff comes out if you don't understand people on some level I mean sure like you were never a sociopath it's <laughs> <laughs> a, a low bar but I'm appreciative of clearing it fair enough <laughs> but I mean like I don't know I told you I read how to win influence how to win friends and influence people a bunch of times the first time I read it I was 12 years old I think or like 11 like my dad got it for me and I, I just you know, I like studied the hell out of it, and yeah, I guess it's. I mean, that's influenced the way that I've approached the world, and so did my. I, I have an admission to make. I've never read it, but it was on my mom's bedside table for a really long time. Interest, like when you were growing up, or. Yeah, yeah. When it's I was a good read. I mean, I, it's most of it's probably stuff where you're just gonna be like, yeah, I knew that. But it's just it's just reinforcing like it's it's like yeah. just a series of truisms you know that that kind of you're like okay yeah people like it when you smile people like it when you remember their name um, you know like uh, people like it when you take an interest in what they're doing and look at things from the other person's perspective rather mm -hmm. than your own and consider the motivation well, that's empathy right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's it ties into this theme of like making the things that you kind of innately know as a human being interacting with other human beings really explicit so you can digest them and keep them salient. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, let's end An hour 20. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, can, we can cut it if you want. Like, I'm not, like, we can talk forever. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I love you. You're one of my, one of my better friends here. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a good, that's a good message to end on. Like, you know, be empathic, you know, be empathic, listen right. to the other person, have a vested interest, take their perspective, always consider like what their feelings could be. And your behavior will change a little bit. And like, I don't know, I feel like everything's finally starting to click in a way that, you know, I was not in this place mentally like a year ago. That's interesting. Cause you don't, you don't seem like that different of a dude to me just hanging out and talking to you now. But yeah. I mean, it's cool to see you feel like you've got that level of clarity. Like I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that. A year ago, I was really not that happy. And it was like deep rooted frustration and deep rooted, like not quite anger, but bordering on anger that started kind of bubbling through into my personal life at times and like I just had a really low tolerance for certain things and I don't think I was as pleasant a person 
That's and, interesting. Well, I guess, like, to be honest, there, there have been points in my life where I felt like, and this is going to sound really arrogant, but, like, I'm just like, why aren't more people, like, as smart as me? Like, this is frustrating. I'm really lonely. Like, I, I can't, I, nobody gets it, you know? And it, it was just not a good way to live my life. Like, I, I, I was pretty miserable with that the worldview. And, I mean, you know, like... I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be like an intellectual elitist, but I mean, I feel like everybody brings something to the table for the most part. I mean, and like, I don't know. I don't feel that way anymore. And I don't know what really changed. Maybe it's to do with just trying to find common ground and see good in everyone. Um, yeah. And there's an argument to be made for letting go I'm going to call it the, but like letting go of the ego. There is a, a book that my sister who recently did like a master's of psychology at, at Columbia and is a real big impetus for a lot of this like change in, in me. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't be who I am today without that influence from her. And also I'd like to meet her someday from Cassie, but um, certainly possible. Um, she got everybody in my family a book on essentially letting go of the ego. Was it Ego is the Enemy? No, it was not quite so on the nose. I don't remember <laughs> what it was called. Um, I, I read, read that one a little bit ago. I really liked it. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, I read about three chapters of it, and like it was on my Kindle, and my Kindle disappeared for a while it was complicated excuses for why i haven't finished the damn book <laughs> i should uh but like that acknowledgement of what the ego is and subsequently the conscious suppressing of it like goes a huge huge way towards a, a like worldview and positioning and, and persona that just kind of does good. But I, I think you've been on this journey for a while because I, I remember I heard you say maybe like five years ago and it stuck with me. I am an engineer without an ego. Like you said this to me at one point and I always tried to be. It wasn't true for a long time. <laughs> well, I mean, all of us have an ego, right? Like, and so, to some extent, I don't, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, I guess I had someone else on the show, uh, Eli Wegman, who's uh, a pretty awesome designer. I, I like that guy a lot. But I guess he's really embraced Buddhism, and he kept saying to me, like, dude, your ego is, like, getting you, man. <laughs> like, I, don't know. Well, I, I try to be, too. I, I think it's a con continual sort of you know struggle one person that i i talk to a lot says it's okay to have an ego but it's not okay to have a fragile ego which i think is an interesting take on it sure know your worth right that's kind of what that comes down to yeah yeah for sure or be willing to to have it challenged mm -hmm. exactly both both of those things like, yeah know your worth and stand up to the challenge is when appropriate but, but like even like attaching worth to yourself is kind of a weird concept, right? Because like I mean I do it, but like I, I'm I'm just to, to self-examine right now. Like I don't know that it's always the healthiest because I feel like my worth changes when different metrics are applied. Like my worth in terms of what, right? So like you yeah. know like how good I am at picking locks, making a sandwich. Right. Measure what matters, right? You know, like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. This has gotten philosophical. philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't really mean it, but like, that's that's kind of where my head's at these days. Is like, I'm doing a little less of the really technical stuff. I'm doing a lot more like resource management, project planning, and kind of trying to be
be a source of influence for a team. Nice. Guide them towards higher quality output. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. And it's it's kind of my first time on this journey, but I am approaching it from a position of just like trying to be as self-aware as possible, trying to seek out objective truth without ego, right? That was that was always my big thing. It was like I don't care if I'm right, I just want to do the right thing. Yeah. So I'm not gonna not always like, easy. Yeah. But definitely right. worthwhile, yeah. Yeah. I'm 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 not gonna fight for my viewpoint because it's mine. I'm gonna like try and be as objective as possible in my decision making. So I to that end, like my statement holds true, but I was an asshole until like a year ago. <laughs> I disagree. Like... <laughs> I'm glad you're improving yourself. I, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've been friends for a decade, dude. I, I've, yeah, I've been right. a fan of yours for a very long time. I don't think you were, you were an asshole entirely. I mean, no, I always. But like... I'm glad that you've improved yourself, and I hope that I always continue to do the same. I, I, have a really I, I think you're giving yourself less credit than you deserve for past you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's appreciated. But yeah, you're you're always distorted in your own worldview, right? Yeah. Um, I have a really good friend who is three ish years into a relationship and now married. And the influence of his wife is tangible. Oh. Like, it's this injection of, like, thoughtfulness and empathy and like the the kind of fading away of ego and much the same journey that i found myself on my brother like when he started dating his now wife i i i don't think i've observed this in you to the extent that i've observed this in him but he genuinely was quite the asshole <laughs> like i don't often talk about my personal life on here but like, I mean, this is this is a dude that like, you know, just like, I don't know. I don't I don't want to alienate anyone who might be listening. But he had some douchey mannerisms, <laughs> put it that way. It and, happens. Yeah. Um, but I mean, his his now wife. I mean, has definitely made him a better person. Like, I, without a, beyond a question of a doubt. Like, I, I think she's awesome. Um, you'd like her a lot. Like, she's like. Um, She's like a food pornographer, so she does. I mean, that's not like her actual job title. Sort of. So she does like, uh, like I, I believe, and I, I probably have it wrong. It's like social media for like multiple like food brands. So she, sure. she yeah. like, she. I think she takes on like three or four clients, and then she'll just like figure out how to get them exposure. But she really, really like. She's super good at it. Like, she'll, she'll like, I remember one time she was trying to get a particular brand of pancakes as a client, and she had their product, like, all around, like, the kitchen of the house that they were staying in, and it was, like, really just trying to, like, eat, you know, breathe shit, you know, like, that brand. And, and so, like, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for somebody that can you know, they can do that and, and, and just alter their perspective to get their head around a job. And so, like, I, I, I just, I don't know, she's great. Um, but, like, I, I noticed, like, Mason, uh, my brother, like, I mean, his, his taste is better, like, he's, like, <laughs> nicer, <laughs> he's happier. If you want to talk about taste, I won't tell you what I served to Cassie on our early dates, but she was someone working in fine dining and in like some of the top cocktail bars in the country. And I was like erudite. I was just so unprepared for that. This is embarrassing, but what does erudite mean? <laughs> it's like completely uneducated. Got it. Okay. In that field. 
I served her peppermint schnapps and soy milk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like working at fucking the the best cocktail bars in our city. <laughs> That's funny. I don't know <laughs> what I did right because that should have scared her the fuck away. I mean, you're fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Considered you a very good friend for a very long time, um, like a third of my life now. Good lord. <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's, it's important to like stay close to people. Relationships matter. People yeah, absolutely. Matter. Psychology matters. That's kind of my, my big kick at the moment. I mean that's um, all you really got is, is you know, your friends at the end of the day, you know. Yeah, right. And yourself, your sanity, I guess, you know, like your work you can look back on. I mean, maybe so a family. Fun. I don't know. Yeah, I, I heard something really interesting yesterday from an Uber driver. He was an Uber driver for the rich and famous in Los Angeles. Wait. Not an Uber, sorry. He was a waiter, not an Uber driver. He's an Uber driver now, but like he was a waiter for the rich and famous in Los Angeles. So like a, a private waiter? Or like a, just a restaurant that a lot of these folks frequented. Unclear, Got to it. be honest. Um, I'm leaning towards the latter, but some of the stories sound like the former. I'm not sure. Okay, I mean, it, you can do both, right? So like you, right. you can work at a restaurant, but do catering gigs. Right. His takeaway was that as someone seeking fame or going to come into fame, it's really, really important to have established your important relationships prior to the explosion of fame. Interesting. So that you know who your friends are, because after you're famous, everyone's kind of out to get you, or at least that's the worldview of a lot of really famous people. Out to get you or out to befriend you so that you can get something from the person? Out to get something from you. Right? Okay. Right, right. So if you are someone who is focused on your relationships and your friendships and your connections and like nurtured that prior to becoming super famous, those are relationships you'll have forever and they'll stick with you for your entire life and they'll be really important like they are for anybody. Yeah. If you don't do that, and you have no real, like, relationships... You'll develop a heroin and addiction. <laughs> suddenly, you find yourself really famous, and, like, you know, everybody knows who you are. It's really hard to filter out the real friendships from that noise. And I thought that was really insightful. Yeah, I concur. I had never thought about it quite like that, but great insight for my Uber driver. No, I mean, I'm certainly not famous and I probably never will be um, but I mean that's that's definitely I, I there's definitely truth to that right I mean even if when I think that that translates into our world with like positions of power at work right so like I mean if you're like a high level executive so like I have um, a buddy who is uh the son of like a former fortune 500 ceo and when he was going to school his area that he grew up in was a little bit of a company town and parents would send their kids to befriend him and it, it became apparent that they were put up to it because they thought it would advance their career so like it's 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 interesting so i think yeah that's probably the closest you and i will get to that but like Maybe my podcast will explode. I'll be like the next, uh, like Jay Z or Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Let's fucking go. No, I don't. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be a miserable existence. But maybe not. <laughs> yeah. I sell a line of cosmetics. You. Right. Oh my god. <laughs> I can tell you as someone with like a reach at one point in the in the tens of thousands, like 
I, it you become beholden to it in a weird way. And I mean, I feel I, obligated to put these out every week. I missed like yeah. four of them, but we're back, baby. Great. I'm I'm honestly kind of thankful that uh, I got zucked. I had a what? Like your Facebook account got destroyed? I had a somewhat successful Instagram account that got shut down. Oh, why? Never okay, got a yeah. reason. Ah, that's it's stupid. Terms of service, but I swear I, I read through the terms of service. I swear I never did. I was very careful. Brutal. But twenty-seven thousand followers gone. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But I will tell you. Does like, Facebook I own am... Instagram? I didn't even realize yeah. that. Okay, yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Sucked. Um, <laughs> I, I got like that. <laughs> or like Start using that. That's funny. I, I think I like it better than the more on the nose Zuck fucked. Zuck like, fucked? That's funny. I, I think Zucked is just better. Zucked yeah, I like that more too. Like it's definitely uh it's nuanced. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and you know exactly what it means. Like it's still on the nose. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that's like I'm, I'm much happier now that I don't have to like be tied to Instagram in the same way. It's, yeah, it's no, like I crazy. actually I I deleted my Facebook account probably three or four years ago. I don't remember exactly when I did it, but I just remember I was spending like two or three hours a day, and I didn't have that kind of followership. But I mean, I. I I mean, it's designed to drain your time, right? I mean, that's the whole point of Facebook is to sell you to advertisers. Yes, much and to like, keep you on the platform as long as possible. Correct, so that they can monetize your time to advertisers. Which is yeah. nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a business. I'm I, I, not against that aspect. But, like, what I don't like is being treated like a fucking Skinner box experiment, right? And, I, you know, and I, and, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you just... I mean, this sounds kind of douchey, but, like, I mean, the only way you're going to get out of that is if you get zucked, like you said, or if you just make a decision not to participate. Right. right. And so, I mean... The it's only not an easy decision to make, considering, like, a full fourth of the world is on Facebook. Or something. Well, and, and there were a few times when I, I said, you know, I'm thinking about deleting this, you know, like... And I, and I kind of, you know, wimped out because, like, somebody would be like, well, you know, like, how are you going to keep in touch with, you know, us folks in Europe, you know? That, yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's a good point. But, like, finally I did it, and people put up a bunch of reasons, and I'm like, well, why don't you just add me on WhatsApp? You know, like, I'm, I'm going to get rid of it, um, you know, this day. These are other ways to Here's my email address, here. you know, like... Um, yeah. I don't know that I posted my phone number, but like I, I, I might have actually just posted my phone. I mean, I, I, I was just like, you know, just call me, you know. Like, there's, there's ways you can get a hold of me, you know. And so, I, um, I have to confess, I still have a LinkedIn account, and so that's that's the only social media I'm currently at. That in like dating apps, but like considering a huge amount of like career recruiting happens through LinkedIn. I think that's still a worthwhile one to have. I've made amounts of money I'm not going to say through opportunities that came up on LinkedIn. I mean, like, yeah, like, yep. I mean, most of the money I've made in my career has been brought to you by LinkedIn. <laughs> you know? Right. So. We are desperately trying to hire some, some roles at my company, and, like, we're just reaching out via LinkedIn now because that's that's what you do so I would I would not get rid of that one in a hurry no I don't it's want to it's nearly as toxic as like well that's the thing like I mean it's I've thought about <laughs> when I was a kid I was a I was a jerk like me and my brother and sister would like make a day of like trolling people together and like I'm not proud of it but I think it's kind of funny which is why I'm getting it's the same it's the same idea as like the harmless prank calling that sure yeah and, and internet, we did that right? too right I mean like before the internet we would like spoof call some like restaurant hi can I get like three orders of dicks please <laughs> and just like snicker amongst dude we, we were worse than that we would order pizza like I I, I dated somebody at one point who worked at a restaurant 
And I felt bad because um, they hated their job. And so I called the restaurant up and I ordered like 10 pizzas that you would never want to eat. Like I asked for t toppings that made no sense to get there. I was like, what's that? I, I shouldn't be laughing as I say this because it really was a mean thing to do to the business owner. But uh, I'll, I'll tell the story anyway because I've started. So I, I, I ordered, I was like, what's the most expensive thing on your menu? And I, I think it was like crab cakes. I'm like, can you put four or five of those on a pizza with anchovies and um, I like green peppers and, you know, like spam like, i don't remember what exactly i asked for but it wasn't something appetizing <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> and I, I just i made it my goal to waste as many other resources as possible and i, I would never do this you know at this point in my like like <laughs> a million years i mean I've, I've been a business owner like it was it's a horrible thing to do to, you to all anybody up a little bit, right? but yeah exactly um but i mean it's still funny to remember <laughs> it's like i don't know I don't, I don't think that's I don't think that's evil to, to see the humor in some horrible shit you did as a kid. People always remember this as like something you did and your perspective just shifts on it as you get older, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, I I am stoked about like what the thirty have in store it's been tumultuous so far but like well, how old are you oh we're gonna do that huh? you don't have to tell me uh, you <laughs> said the 30s i'm 33 the so. 30s uh i have not yet completed the 30th year oh no worries uh, we don't uh, we can edit it out if you don't want to like age yourself doesn't really matter. we're basically the same i'm 33 you're you're yeah right 20, 29 presumably i mean that is that is the college friendship. You only have a limited window in which to like be part of the same group. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So, I, I don't know, man. They're like, I look back at my twenties, not not with regret, but like I am a distinctly different person now than I was. I don't think the don't year think. itself makes a difference, right? Because that's just arbitrary bullshit. But like. I hate to admit it, because when I was in my early 20s and even a little bit as a teenager, I, I had lots of friends of different ages, and, you know, I, I would I would always say age is just a number, doesn't mean anything, when I was justifying being, like, a 22-year-old that was friends with, like, a 40 or 50-year-old, um, but, and, and I, I stand behind that, like, you know, I, I still value my connections I had with those people, and I don't think I would change any of that, but, um, it definitely, <laughs> experience shapes you, right? I mean, there's no getting around that, like, I mean, it can make you better, it can make you worse, it can just make you different, um, you can, you can get gun shy, uh, you can... Your grandma can tell you that pigeons will peck your eyeballs out and to avoid them when you're a small child. And so now as a 20-something or 30-something, you are still convinced that pigeons will peck your eyeballs out. And oh, absolutely. Afraid of them. That's All amazing. kinds of things can happen. It's, it's, it's incredible when you find one of those lies that was implanted at you early on, too, and, and like you <laughs> figure it out. And you're like... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's getting harder for parents to do that because the internet is like right over there and it's yeah. so easy to verify, you know, like if you're, if you're just, you know, BSing a kid to get them off your, like the kid's like, oh, no, 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 according to Wikipedia, <laughs> yeah. like, pigeons are actually pretty harmless and, you know, it's like, oh, shit, yep. caught, you know. My parents tried to rename potatoes on me and I didn't fall for it. Wait, what did they try to rename potatoes? I wish I remembered, but I didn't like potatoes. And so they tried to serve me potatoes at one point, and they're just like, these are like small dishes. I don't know the word. And I was just like, oh, great, let me try that. And I don't like small dishes. A minute later, it was like, mm, these taste like potatoes. <laughs> Called them up. Didn't work. That's fucking hilarious. My, I, uh, this is probably more baggage than I want to reveal, but I'll do it anyway. 
I, I had a babysitter that would like I mean it wasn't like horrible physical abuse but she would like spank me and she referred to it as a reprimand it was actually quite clever so yeah. that when I told my parents, hey, the babysitter's hitting me, <laughs> like, I got reprimanded. A reprimand was, like, an especially hard spanking. <laughs> like oh, that, yep. By that definition. So that was one yep. that, that... I think I figured that one out, like, pretty early. But it was... You know, took, took a dictionary. If you really fuck up, you get hit really hard? Well, no, no the reprimand doesn't actually mean that. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Scolded. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we all got stuff we deal with. Yeah, our our current is just it's the accumulation of our pasts. You froze, so I'm guessing I froze. You did. I heard our current is just the accumulation of our pasts. That's what I said. No. I was trying to like conclude here on something pithy and, and you know, insightful. Nah, that's definitely <laughs> the truth. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Well, here's to, like, fucking many more years of hanging out with you. Absolutely. And uh, to personal growth and all that, right? Here, here. Because if you're not getting better, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yep. Alright, brother. I'll catch you later. Word. Word.